Income tax receipts expected to hit a record high this year. We will explain what's behind all of that. Plus, the biggest wealth transfer in the history of mankind expected to occur over the next 25 years. We're going to give you some numbers, some perspective, and maybe what you should be doing to plan for that if you're in that category. And this also, things to do now for retirees to offset the impact of a market decline on their portfolio. So certainly a timely topic there. Welcome to the program. This, of course, is Dollars and Cents, where we help you make sense out of all of life's decisions involving your dollars. My name is Joel Garris. I'm a certified financial planner, certified financial fiduciary at Nelson Financial Planning, where our team of certified financial fiduciary stands ready this week to help you change your life with a successful and cost-effective financial plan. Certainly an interesting week in the markets this past week. As we said in our email to our clients that we sent out on Friday, always good to have some perspective and historical context in times like these. As we were talking a little bit about on the program last week, if you look at the 12 prior bear markets over the course of the past 70 years, what you will see is that the average return in the subsequent year after the markets breached that threshold, the return was 23.9%. It's a pretty good number. Certainly something to consider when it comes to your investments. Of course, that number is an average. We talked last week on the program at length about some of the exceptions to that average and certainly would encourage our listeners to check us out either on our YouTube channel at Nelson Financial Planning or your favorite podcast channel as well if you're interested in hearing more of our conversation on that from last week's program. To summarize, we talked a little bit about some of the things economically that as we look forward should be some pretty positive driving forces for the economy. Things like dividends, things like technology and healthcare innovation, those kinds of things are going to be major drivers of future economic productivity and for that matter, market growth. So we encourage you to listen to the program last week if you missed it. Just check it out on your favorite podcast channel platform or our YouTube channel. As always, if you have any trouble locating us on those various platforms, just go to our website, nelsonfinancialplanning.com. Upper right-hand corner, there's a bunch of icons. Click on the one that looks most familiar to you. As we mentioned in the email to our clients on Friday, we're going to be hosting a mid-year conference call on Tuesday Hard to believe this coming Friday, July 1, that'll mean that we're in the back half, playing the back nine, so to speak, for the year 2022. If you're a client, you should have gotten that email on Friday. If not, uh, certainly give us a call at the office and we can connect you to the information to join in on that call. Should be pretty interesting. Let's not forget the back half of the year also holds midterm elections. Certainly a lot of stuff coming out of the Supreme Court this past week, to say the least, that will be perhaps a major impact on those midterm elections. So keep that all in mind as we think about the back half of the year. The week that was, albeit a four-day week, right? Uh, Monday was a market holiday. The week that was sort of underscores our usual comments about volatility, right? We always talk about volatility as it loves company. So when it's around, it usually stays around. But remember, it goes both ways, up and down. And certainly last week was a nice reminder that volatility includes both of those types of movement, whether that's 
down and up. So certainly the broad-based markets had a very good week, even though it was a short week, uh, up over 6.5% in just those four days. The Dow alone gained over 1,600 points. So you may be asking yourself, like, why? Why did that happen? Isn't that kind of bizarre that here we are, gas prices still high, inflation still peaking, or hopefully peaking, and uh, the Federal Reserve fully committed to raising interest rates. So, so it probably struck you as a little bizarre that, well, why did the markets have such a really strong week? Kind of out of nowhere, because the reality is the headlines haven't necessarily, necessarily changed. And in a lot of cases, particularly if you look at consumer sentiment numbers, things like that, some of the numbers that came out this past week, you could certainly make the argument that they were weaker economic numbers. So how, against that backdrop, did the market do what it did? That's always kind of the conundrum, if you will. And I think it starts with explaining what the market did this, this past week, starts with understanding the battle, if you will, that is happening economically in the year 2022. So on one corner, we've got inflation. In the other corner, we have interest rates. And they're trying to combat each other, inflation obviously increasing, which means that if you're running the Federal Reserve, then you have to raise interest rates because one of the things that you don't want is unchecked inflation. So what happens then is you wind up raising interest rates to help combat that, right? You raise interest rate, it slows the economy. By its very definition, higher interest rates are an economic drag. So when you hear people talk about recession and the suggestion of recession, certainly in the media, that's where that comes from, right? Because higher interest rates, meaning that when you borrow money, you have to pay more to do it, doesn't matter whether you're an individual or corporation or whatever the case, then if you've got to pay more for something, then yeah, that sort of acts as an economic drag. Remember, technical definition of recession, two quarters in a row that are negative in terms of economic growth. Well, if you remember the economic data of three months ago, it showed that the first quarter of this year sort of already checked that box. So you don't have to go that far really just the second quarter, if that winds up being a negative number, then poof, you've met the technical definition of a recession. So those are the battles. Those are That's the fight, if you will, that is raging on. And the reality is that when you see the market drop, what's happening out there is, is because of the market drop, that, as you might well expect, unleashes a pretty powerful, almost disinflationary type of, of impulse. And there's been a lot of research in that, but if you stop and think about it, it, it should kind of make sense, right? If you see your portfolio go down, if you see your 401k go down, if you're retired and looking at your portfolio and it goes down, well, the natural tendency is gonna be, mm, maybe I'll spend a little less. And as you spend less, right, that creates less demand which then alleviates that upward pressure on prices. Hopefully that sort of makes sense. I don't wanna turn the show into like an economics 101 class, but that's how it works and that's how it's playing out right now. So we've got some interesting numbers on consumer sentiment that came out this past week as well. As we talk more about sort of why the market did what it did this past week here on the program, Dollars and Cents with Joel Garris, continuing after these messages. Hopefully not turning today's program into an Economics 101 conversation, but we thought it important to kind of talk through, if you will, a little bit about how the market behave the way that it did this past week, up over 6.5% just in four days, against the backdrop of continuing negative economic data. And I think this is an important point that people sometimes miss when they think about market performance, is that oftentimes the market starts to show improvement even while the headlines continue to get 
worse. Certainly way too early. Let me be very clear. Way too early to say uh, all clear and it's straight up from here. Volatility, as we remind folks on a regular basis, on the program has two components. So you'll see days where the market drifts down, and then, but you'll also see days where the market drifts up. That's the definition of volatility, right? It's going up and down this past week, sort of the ups one, if you will. But what's really happening out there economically is, is how it is playing out, right? This battle, if, we, if you will, that we were talking about in the first segment uh, between high inflation and higher interest rates and which one is going to ultimately take the day and how they are fighting and, and really almost interchangeable or intermixed, if you will, because in order to fight high inflation, then you need higher interest rates. What do higher interest rates do? Well, they work as effectively a pumping of the brakes on demand, a pumping of the brakes on the economy, because part of what drives inflation, right, is demand. And so consequently, you had some interesting consumer sentiment data come out. Managed The consumer sentiment typically measured by University of Michigan survey goes all the way back to 1952. So it's been around a long time. Uh, it, it scored a reading for the month of June of 50 out of its 100 point scale. The reality is, though, that's the lowest reading on record. So the data coming out and the market going up and you against this backdrop of very negative consumer sentiment that the, the, the market rationale, certainly this past week is, well, wait a minute, if we've got a market to climb, which in and of itself reduces demand, if we've got con negative consumer sentiment, which in itself reduces demand, right? People are not feeling happy, they're not gonna go out and spend, then it may mean that some of the Federal Reserve's work in terms of raising interest rate is to getting taken care of by this combination of more negative sentiment and a decline in the market. So interesting sort of to see how all of this plays out economically and against the data that's coming out as well as we continue to sort of observe this interest rate versus inflation. Two other pieces of data points that came out this past week that we thought we would share with you as well that sort of underscore all of this. Since the beginning of the year, there's been a 34% drop in the price it takes to have a container ship from China to the US. So stop and think about the implications of that, right? So we heard a lot about how much shipping costs were going up over the past several months. So the reality is that of late, they've been declining. So that helps to take the pressure off in terms of price increases and inflation. Similarly, an over an 8% drop in gas sold from a year ago, right? That makes sense, it's more expensive. So, so people are taking a little bit more planning and a little bit more precaution in terms of just, you know, hopping in the car and driving around. And that marked the 14th consecutive week of decline. Again, all of this helps to maybe fight this battle of tackling inflation without having to raise interest rates quite so much. Obviously, the market liked that analysis or that approach, but certainly something to remember Particularly important, of course, is this concept that even though the economic data may in and of itself be negative, it may very well help to keep those interest rates in check. So as always on the program, we will continue to kind of keep you posted as these things develop. Certainly record low consumer sentiment, high gas prices, and the declining market are a very, very hard combination. But they can have some counterinflationary forces. We'll see how it plays out. Obviously, continue to stay tuned to the program for an ongoing conversation of that, because after all, that's what we do each and every week here on Dollars and Cents. My name, of course, Joel Garris, Certified Financial Planner, Certified Financial Fiduciary with Nelson Financial Planning, where our team of folks, Certified Financial Fiduciaries, all stand ready and willing to help you change your life with a cost-effective 
and financial plan. So speaking of the battle that is sort of raging out there between interest rates and inflation, it's wrecking havoc even more so, not just on the stock side, but also on the bond side. Why? Because there is an inverse relationship between interest rates and bond prices. As interest rates go up, bond prices go down. So fixed rate bond market is having its worst year in several decades, which then translates over to your typical conservative middle of the road mix, if you will, that would be a very traditional 60-40 balanced type of approach. So a balanced type of approach, 60% stocks, 40% bonds, very classic in terms of investment allocation. That portfolio, right? Because 60-40 uh, uh, mix, right? You get, so you get 60% of the stocks, I get 40% of the bond side. So the, the, the concept of that design is that that's pretty broadly diversified. It should be able to weather whatever the storms are, because if something's happening maybe on the stocks, then maybe the bonds are hanging in, things like that. That's where that whole concept comes from. The problem is when you're in this kind of environment, that 60-40 mix, is on track to have its worst performing year in something like 90 years. So I think it's important against that backdrop to remember a couple of rules, but also we're gonna give you some things that you should be doing now in terms of how to approach this from an investment perspective, how to approach this from a portfolio perspective, and from a spending perspective. First and foremost, don't forget the two rules of investing that we view as most important. Number one, diversification. Don't have all your eggs in one basket, have a balance. If you've got a well-diversified portfolio, then you should be looking at individual positions and saying, okay, wait a minute, there's some positions in here that are that are down, yes, but they're not down anywhere near like the overall market. Number two, consistency. Consistency matters. If you're trying to hop in, hop out, look at the data. Week before last, the outflow from the stock market was huge. Just prior to a week where you had a lot of recovery and a lot of repair of that damage that had previously recorded. That always happens. And as easy as it sounds to be consistent, it's probably one of the harder things in life to do, particularly when it comes to your money. But that's the backdrop, right? So not a good year, not a good year for stocks, not a good year for bonds. What can you do? What, what, what are some of the things that you can do now to help maybe offset or address some of the things that are happening out there? We've got three things for you to be thinking about now. Number one, it's always important to make sure that you're holding cash. We've certainly talked about this over the years here on the program. Make sure that you've still got that cash reserve in relatively good shape. Number two, be flexible with your withdrawals. So it, it's one of those things where you can have a fixed percentage. You can have your withdrawals be a fixed percentage of the portfolio value every year. And then that way it adjusts based upon kind of what the market's doing. Or this is typically how we like to do it. You can set your withdrawals based upon a certain percentage of your portfolio. And then as that withdrawal rate increases, that would be where you would take a look and say, okay, maybe I need to make some adjustments in terms of that withdrawal amount that is coming out. And then lastly, it's certainly important to hold off those major expenses, particularly in a time frame when things are not trending particularly well. We're gonna talk more about this. We kind of just hit the highlights there just quickly here at the end of this segment. So stay with us through the break and we'll continue to talk about some of the things that you can do now to help with your portfolio from an investment perspective and a withdrawal perspective. Coming up next here on Dollars and Cents. Talking about some of the things that retirees and investors can do now to sort of help what's been going on in the market. So remember the first two rules that we always talk about, particularly when it comes to investing. Number one, diversification matters. That means you're not having all your eggs in one basket. So you got different things performing differently at different times. So we encourage folks to really look at the individual pieces of their portfolio 
And in there, you should find that some of the pieces are not down like the overall markets, right? That's the very definition of diversification. Number two, consistency is still important and still matters. Make sure you continue to be consistent with what your overall investment approach is. Very difficult to make big decisions when it comes to your investments when you have a very heightened emotional state. Chances are you're not going to make perhaps the best decision that you would have had you not been quite so emotional. Beyond that, what are some of the things that folks can do to maybe help address or sort of mitigate what's been going on inside the portfolio? Well, one of the chief things that we always talk about here on the program is making sure that you've got an emergency savings account. If you don't, it's never too late to try and build one of those up. What's an emergency savings account? Simply means a bunch of money that you got sitting in cash, whether it's in a checking account, savings account, CD, whatever the case may be, all easily accessible, all not subject to any type of fluctuation in terms of the value. So that's number one. Number two, sort of look at how you are taking your withdrawals from your portfolio. If you're retired taking money out of your accounts, it's important to kind of think about how those withdrawals work relative to your underlying balance. So there's a couple of options that you can use that kind of tie those withdrawals more to what's going on in your portfolio, which then increases the chances of that portfolio continuing to be sustainable. The first approach is to do that as a fixed percentage of your portfolio value, right? So every year, beginning of the year, you look at the value, you recalculate what that means in terms of the amount of dollars that you can use based upon a fixed percentage. Maybe it's 3%, 4%, 5%, depending upon your circumstances or how old you are. Not unlike how the required minimum distribution each and every year gets calculated, right? Look at the value at the beginning of the year, divide it by the life expectancy factor, and then you have a percentage. So following that kind of concept across all parts of the portfolio is a good way to make sure that your withdrawals stay consistent with the value of the account. The other way to do it is to sort of do sort of a, a guardrail approach. And we this is kind of the approach that we typically follow here at the office. And it looks at, okay, well, how much are my withdrawals totaling for the year? And compare that to the value. Now, you wanna make sure then that that number typically stays in a four to 6% range, right? So as the withdrawal amounts go up, obviously that can drive up the withdrawal rate. As the value goes down, that too can also withdraw, uh, increase that withdrawal rate. So if you're using kind of that guardrail approach where, okay, I wanna make sure that I'm between four and 6%, then that helps to make sure that your withdrawals are not overly hitting your invested money. Once you start getting up to that 6% and sort of trickle over it, maybe it's then time to say, okay, well, how do I adjust how much I'm taking out to make sure that my account is going to continue to remain in good shape for me for as long as I need that. So important to be flexible on the withdrawal rates and kind of consider those withdrawal rates that are based more upon the value of the account or with sort of that guardrail approach that sort of continually looks at the amount of the withdrawals on an annual basis relative to the value of the account. And then lastly, as we like to say, sort of the flip of sort of one of the concepts that we were talking about last year, when the market was doing very well, we talked to a lot of folks about, well, if you've got some major expenses coming up over the next year or so, certainly a great time to take the money and pay for those now when things are going well. Conversely, when things aren't going as well, perhaps you hold off on said major purchases or major improvements or changes or what have you until a time when things are going better. So I guess in summary, the concept there is make sure that you're willing to have some flexibility in terms of how that income plays out and how you are using that income. So some important things to be thinking about for all investors, particularly retirees, because if you're using your money and the market is going down, then best you have a decent strategy to know where that ultimately is going to make sure that 
things are going to be sustainable going forward. So it's certainly important to kind of look at those withdrawals and those withdrawal rates to make sure that things are sustainable going forward. Speaking of sustainable going forward, over the course of the next 25 years, there will be the largest wealth transfer in the history of mankind. We got some interesting numbers on that that we're going to show share with you here in this segment. So welcome to Dollars and Cents, where we help you make sense out of all of life's decisions involving your dollars. We're Central Florida's longest running radio program, coming to you on a host of radio stations throughout the Central Florida region. I think we're on like four or five different uh, stations these days. So make sure that you listen to us here Sunday mornings on the live program, or if you miss any part of it, or you maybe you want to listen to a prior program, certainly last week's program, we were talking about sort of what was going on in the economy and bear market and giving a historical perspective might be a good one to listen to. Then you can always check us out on your favorite podcast channel or our YouTube channel. Simply search for Nelson Financial Planning and you'll find us. If you have problems finding us, go to our website, nelsonfinancialplanning.com and you can get directly connected to those channels on your favorite podcast or social media platform of choice. My name, of course, Joel Garris, Certified Financial Planner, Certified Financial Fiduciary at Nelson Financial Planning. So here are the here is the data. Biggest transfer of wealth in the history of mankind happening over the course of the next 25 years. Expected transfer, otherwise known as inheriting, $72.6 trillion over the next 25 years here in the U.S. alone. That is more than twice the amount projected just a decade ago. So some pretty dramatic numbers that are getting transferred from one generation for the next. For people born between 1965 and 1980, also known as Gen X, the anticipated inheritance is expected to be 30 trillion over the next 25. So Gen X about ready to get about half of that wealth transfer over the next 25 years, 30 trillion over the next 25 years. Millennials uh, we'll get roughly the other half. And I guess that makes sense when it comes to thinking about the generations as they play out. Millennials over the next 25 years will inherit roughly 27.5 trillion. So between Gen X and millennials, most that's where most of that money will wind up. Now, here's the cautionary tale. Perhaps you've heard of this family called the Vanderbilts, right? I mean, the name's ubiquitous, right? They've even still got a university. It's like a common expression, right? I mean, who are we? The Rockefellers, the Vanderbilt? I mean, here's the interesting coda, I guess, to the story of one Cornelius Vanderbilt. In 1877, he was widely considered one of the richest men on the planet. In 1877, he left a hundred million dollar estate to his heirs. A lot of money back then whole lot of money back then. While one would think, certainly, that at a hundred million, that kind of inheritance would certainly be enough to maintain family fortune for years and years and years to come. In just four generations, four generations, the Vanderbilt descendants lost it all with reckless spending and careless investing. Family reunion in 1973 with 120 Vanderbilt descendants revealed that not a single one of them was a millionaire. 70% of high net worth families do not retain their wealth beyond the second generation. Those are some pretty dismal statistics. When we return after the break, we're going to talk about some of the things that you can do to maybe, you know, prevent that. Maybe you're not the Vanderbilts. But maybe you do have some assets that you've accumulated over a lifetime and you want to make sure that it just doesn't all disappear in the wind. So coming up next on the program, we'll talk about that here on Dollars and Cents. How not to be like the Vanderbilts. That's what we're talking about here on the program. We talked a little bit about those numbers, right? I mean, Cornelius Vanderbilt passed away in 1877, leaving an estate worth over $100 million at the time. And lo and behold, 
That's a lot of money, by the way, 1877. I mean, that's a huge amount of money. And lo and behold, within four generations, it was gone. And certainly the statistics just across the board when it comes to inheriting money, something like 96% spent within 18 months. So how do you avoid that? particularly if you've worked and saved and accumulated assets and wealth over time. Maybe it's not Vanderbilt level, but maybe it's at least level that could make a difference, right? Even a few hundred grand makes that kind of a difference if it goes to some family members. So at the end of the day, what are some of the things that you can do to try and maybe avoid the Vanderbilt train wreck, if you will? We've got three four concepts or things to be thinking about when it comes to that. Number one, we think it's important, as with everything, to plan ahead, right? Have some kind of a structure, some kind of a game plan in place in terms of what you want the money to be used for, how you want that money to be dispersed, how, uh, it, to the extent you want to put some strings on it, some restrictions on it. Those are all things that you can certainly do when it comes to money. Number two, and this one's pretty important, it's certainly important to educate, not just educating yourself on, okay, what are some of the ways in which I can make sure that this money continues on after my passing, but also bring in to the conversation the next generation and, and really have that conversation to make sure that they understand what's at stake and how it plays out. There's a lot of books, there's a lot of programs, certainly Dave Ramsey, those kinds of things have a lot of opportunities to really make sure that that generation that's ultimately gonna inherit this wealth, your wealth, uh, should we say, is informed and understands and has a good perspective and a good handle on how it relates to managing one's finances. And then number three, sort of on this concept, is to understand the tax and the state laws. And this one, you probably want to go out and use someone who's an expert in those types of fields. But because the reality is that sometimes assets, when they pass, are going to be taxable and sometimes they're not. Sometimes when asset passes, there are mandated, think retirement accounts, which is where a lot of net worth and wealth is today, that are mandated by the government to come out of those types of accounts within a 10 year period of time. So how do you address that? How do you deal with that in terms of planning, not just for now, but for when you pass, and how ultimately then that goes to the next generation. And what's the tax implications on those types of an account? So certainly important to make sure that you have an understanding of how all of those assets could potentially be transferred. And then lastly, and this is probably, I guess, the biggest issue or the biggest sticking point for many people when it comes to this topic is you probably want to sit down and communicate and have a conversation. Now, I know that's always a touchy conversation when it comes to talking about money with your family. But the reality is that better to have the conversation now than not at all, particularly when you look at some of these statistics involving wealth and wealth transfer. Know this, over the course of the next 25 years, over 70 odd trillion dollars is going to be transferred from one generation to the next. That money mostly split up between Gen Xers and millennials. Maybe it's time to have that conversation of what that looks like and the ways in which you can help that next generation understand finances and what it looks like. Because after all, who wants to turn into the Vanderbilts, right? You have all this money and then all of a sudden it's all gone. That's a very real issue and one that certainly statistically we see play out over the course of society on a regular basis. So some things to be thinking about on that front. Uh, welcome, of course, to the program. Uh, this is Dollars and Cents. My name is Joel Garris. I'm a, Nel a certified financial planner, certified financial fiduciary at Nelson Financial Planning. Looking at the clock, we want to try and get this last topic in because we talked about it at the top of the show. If we talk about it at the top of the show as a topic that we're going to talk about, it kind of requires us to talk about it. We may not get to all of it, so we may 
carry over some of this for next week. But I don't know if you saw this, but individual income tax payments are on pace to reach a record level this year. Congressional Budget Office, no shock, don't really understand and can't really explain why tax revenues are hitting the high that they are. Here are the numbers. Individual income tax collections are poised to reach $2.6 trillion, or roughly 10 and a half, 10.6% of the economy in the fiscal year that ends September 30th. That is up over 9% from the year 2021 and would mark a record in the 109 year history of tax, topping wartime receipts of 1944 and dot-com receipts of the year 2000 as a percentage of GDP, of course, uh, in terms of absolute numbers. Well, but of course, it's a, always gonna be a big number, but in terms of relative to GDP, you're looking at tax revenue that is about to set an all-time high on that comparative basis. Now, when you start to look at the data, what's happening is that it is business owners and investors that are paying more and more of that share. It, certainly, a lot of the data suggests that it's capital gains, business income that are driving that trend because when you look at non-withheld tax, collections on non-withheld taxes. So withheld taxes would be part of your payroll, part of your W-2, part of your paycheck, right? So it, 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 the data on the non-withheld taxes really does seem to be reaching a high amount. Uh, inflation adjusted basis, 522 billion in April of 2022, compared with just over 300 billion in 2018 and 2019, which of course would be years prior to the pandemic. So what's happening there? Well, we think that there's two factors. Number one, obviously a strong market, uh, folks perhaps uh, creating gains or taking profit prior to that long-term uh, schedule kicking in. Remember, if it's a capital gain, if it's a profit, and you sell within a, after a year of holding that, then it's subject to a less tax rate. Well, what they're seeing on a lot of these tax revenues is that a lot more short-term capital gains, short-term capital gains, there's no deal on the tax side of things. It is counts as ordinary income. So that's helping to drive up that, um, that tax receipt. The other item is, I guess, the obvious in terms of explaining why these tax receipts are hitting a pretty high level. Uh, tax proposals or the expectation of tax proposals in fact change behavior. We think that last year a lot of folks were anticipating higher taxes or big tax changes and so consequently there was a lot of a lot more income if you will perhaps pushed into that year than otherwise resulting in these very high tax revenue rates combined with the fact that a lot of tax cuts expire in the year 2025. So just some parting thoughts on that. We got to wrap it up and get on out of here. Thanks for listening to the program. This has been Dollars and Cents with Joel Garris of Nelson Financial Planning.